Okay, so first lecture of chemistry. You first have to say what chemistry is. If you were going to say chemistry is the study of, what would you say? Matter and energy, yes. Chemistry is the study of matter and energy. And this is chemistry cast. Has anyone seen chemistry cast? No. Now you have, you're going to continue to see chemistry cast. Okay? At the end of the semester, we have the last two weeks, we have no lecture. The last two weeks of this class are solely for review for that final exam. Okay? It's going to be sort of a comp competitive type of a thing, and the winner gets chemistry cast trophy. One of my students from a few semesters ago made like a, a clay trophy of chemistry cast, okay? I keep the trophy, but you get to sign the book saying that you won. <laughs> <laughs> so this is chemistry cast. <coughs> so we said chemistry is the study of matter and energy. We're going to talk about both in this class. But by far, we're going to spend a whole lot more time talking about matter. Okay. Energy fits better, in my mind, into a physics class, a chemistry class. But energy is part of chemistry, so we will talk about it in several different ways. <coughs> so the first definition, matter is anything that occupies, occupies space and has mass. So that occupying space is an easy concept to grasp. This occupies space, right? It's taking up space. And it has mass. Mass is very, very similar to weight. We'll talk about the difference between mass and weight later on. But essentially, if something takes up space and has weight, it is matter. Every, every object is made of matter. If it's a thing that's not energy, it is matter. Energy is not matter. Heat, light, things like that, kinetic energy, those are not matter. Those are energy. Matter is different. Energy does not occupy space and does not have mass. So the sun. Is the sun itself matter or energy? And energy. Wouldn't it matter since it occupies space? The sun is actually a thing. There, there's stuff there. That, that, that's the way you can see. If there's stuff, it's matter. Okay? The sun itself is matter. But what's coming off of the sun? Rays. Rays. Energy. There's light and heat. Light and heat are both energy. So in this picture, you, what you're seeing is the, is the matter, but there's plenty of energy coming off of it. So here's a picture. What do you see there that is matter? Everything. People. Everything. Everything. Right? Gosh. If you're seeing it, the objects, well, let's, let's classify them. The objects that you're seeing are matter. The tree, the cars, the light post, the road, all of that is matter. What kind of energy do you see here? Electrical. It's electric, there's electrical energy that's running the lights. Yeah. What other energy? Heat energy from the car by the exhaust. There's heat, mm -hmm. right? There's plenty of heat coming off those cars. What else? The light coming out of the little... The, the light is energy. She said air. What is air? A gas. It's a gas. Yeah. So the matter or energy? Matter. Air is actually matter. We're, we're going to have a whole lecture on gas. Okay. <coughs> gas is funky. Okay. It's like it's not here, but it's there. And we use it all the time. And it is matter. What other types of energy do you see? There's more. Um, the guy on the bicycle? What about him? Motion. What does motion. Yeah. 
kinetic energy. Okay. There are two more more difficult ones. Anybody think of? You're on the right track. How many people have taken physics? If I drop something, when it starts moving, it has kinetic energy. When I lift something, what kind of energy does it have? You may not know this, but we'll, we'll talk about this. Gravity? Potential energy. Potential energy is the ability to get kinetic energy. So that street light is held off the ground. If that broke off, it would fall. That street light has potential energy. Okay. There's also chemical energy. The gasoline in these cars have chemical energy that when we burn the gas, we get heat, because the car gets hot, the engine gets hot, and we also get kinetic energy, because the car moves. But in the gasoline, it's chemical energy. Think of it as almost a way of storing that energy. So, actually, let's do our class. <coughs> what in this class is related to chemistry? People. People. Periodic table. The light bulbs. The light bulbs. What in this class is not related to chemistry? Your shoe. What's it made out of? Well, silk. Is it made out of matter or energy? Matter. Made of matter. So it's related to chemistry, right? So everything in the universe is matter or energy. <coughs> so there's nothing in here that's not related to chemistry. If you were going to categorize things in this class, in this room, how would you categorize? You can make your own categories. Objects. Objects versus, if they have at least two categories. What do you mean not? What do you mean non-concrete? You know, like a matter is something that we can see and it's concrete. You can touch it and everything, but energy you cannot touch. It. Right. So it's something that you can interact with versus yes. energy, which you can't interact. I, mean, I can't inter interact with this light. I, mean, I can't get anything to it, right? What else? You can make your own category, so there's no wrong answer. What's different between this podium and the air? Yeah. This is a solid. What's the air? Yeah. The gas. <coughs> What's Starbucks? Liquid. 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 You have states of matter. You have solid, liquid, gas. Okay. What's different between that desk and that desk? This one. Yeah. It's color. Color. You can categorize by color, right? Something, something different between them. That one's red, that one's yellow. Right? What's different between um <coughs> I'm not got something in my mind, but I'm not seeing an example of it. What's different between Gatorade and orange juice with pulp? One is acidic. One is acidic and one is... Okay, you can classify it that way. That's not what I was going for, but it's <coughs> be correct. What about the texture? So, in the bottle of Gatorade, how many things would you say are in that Gatorade? No, not ingredients, but it's Gatorade, right? But the Gatorade at the top is no different than the Gatorade at the bottom. So you go to the grocery store and you buy a carton of orange juice with pulp. What's going to be different about that carton of orange juice versus the thing of Gatorade sitting right next to it? Pulp's at the bottom. Pulp's at the bottom. There are two things in that carton. There's orange juice and there's pulp. So there's two different, the one that we'll talk about is a heterogeneous mixture. It means there's two different things in there and they're separate things. So, for today, we're going to spend a lot of time breaking things down in the classifications. At the top of our little tree here, we have matter. Under matter, we have pure substances, and we have mixtures. 
Can somebody give me an example of what they think is a pure substance? <coughs> water. Water. Water is water. There's nothing else in there. It's water. Okay, it's a pure substance. What's an example of a mixture? Yogurt and granola. Yogurt and granola. There's, there's yogurt, there's granola. What about the yogurt itself? Is yogurt a mixture? Yes. Yeah. Wait, what's in the yogurt? There's okay. There's, if you try to break it down really small. Fruit. There might be fruit. Yep. Is, Artificial. Is there water in yogurt? Uh, is there uh, water in yogurt? Is there protein in yogurt? Yes. yes. There's protein, there's sugar in yogurt. That's a mixture, okay? So, yogurt is a mixture. Yogurt with granola is a different type of mixture that we'll, we'll, we'll see, okay? So matter is pure substances in mixtures. Either it's one thing at the molecular level, and we'll see, we'll see what that means, or it's multiple things. Water <coughs> is water. Okay? We can break the pure substances down. We have elements and we have compounds. This one is the easiest one. If it's an element, it's up here. If it's not up there, it's a compound, okay? Yes, that periodic table is out of date, but any element we're gonna talk about is up there. So, if it's an element, it's there. If it's there, it's an element. If it's a pure substance and it's not up there, it has to be a compound. So that's the way you classify it. You look at something, and you say, is it an element? Yes, it's an element. Is it an element? No, it's a compound. The compound catches everything else. So what are these elements and compounds? The elements <coughs> are the smallest building block that you can break something down to by a chemical reaction, and it's still the same thing, okay? So, we have hydrogen. We have hydrogen, we have helium, we have all these things, we have carbon. It's the smallest thing that you can break <coughs> the substance down into using chemical reactions. You, if you break that hydrogen down any further, it is not hydrogen anymore. Okay? All of the known elements are on the periodic table. They actually just added five or six of them yesterday. They don't have names yet, so you don't have to. This is the periodic table. You don't have to memorize all of them. Okay? Don't panic. There are, this periodic table looks like it's just stuck thrown out there. The entire semester, we'll see that there is a lot of information crammed into this table. You can get a lot of stuff out of this. Not just the symbols and the numbers, but where things are where they are, how high they are, how low they are, left and right, what they're next to, that all tells us something. Okay? So we have pure substances, elements, elements themselves can be metals and non-metals. So every periodic table, sorry, every element up there <coughs> is going to be a metal or a non-metal. Okay? You don't know what's what yet. So you're going to look at these pictures and try to figure out which one's a metal, which one's not a metal. Looking at phosphorus, phosphorus is the yellow stuff. It's in water because if it was exposed to air, it would blow up. So the phosphorus is the yellow stuff. Is that a metal or a non-metal? Non-metal. Non-metal. Here's some copper. Metal, metal or non-metal? Non-metal. Bromine is the liquid in here. Non-metal. Non-metal. Is nickel? Metal. Lead? Metal. Gold? Metal. Carbon? Non metal. Non metal, but you're not quite confident. Aluminum? Metal. Sulfur? Non metal. Tin? Non metal. How did you know that? We didn't talk about what metals and non metals were. They're solid. Solid? The sulfur and phosphorus are solid. Shiny? Shiny. Believe it or not, shiny is a scientific <coughs> term. Okay? Metals are shiny. Also, they're silver. Not always. 
Gold and copper are shiny, but they're not silver. They're shiny. It's hard to give a definition for shiny, though. But you know shiny when you see shiny, right? If it's shiny, it's probably a metal. The other thing that metals are are electrical conductors. A metal will conduct electricity. If something is shiny and conducts electricity, it's a metal. If it's not a metal, it's a non-metal. So non-metals are dull and <coughs> don't conduct electricity. So here's some magnesium. What do you think it is? Uh, Why metal? It looks shiny. What about selenium? What do you think that is? Non-metal. Non-metal, right? It's not shiny. Let's go back to the previous slide. What did we say carbon was? Non-metal. Non -metal. Now what do you think it is? Non-metal. This one's tricky. Carbon is a non-metal. This is where we get into the whole, we can't define shiny, but we have to define shiny, okay? So there's light reflecting off that carbon, but that's not really shiny. I mean, water will sparkle, right? But water is not a metal. So you kind of have to look at it and say, is that just light reflecting off of it? Or is it shiny? I can't give you a better different definition than shiny for shiny than you can give, okay? But you're never going to be on a quiz or an exam given a picture and say, is this shiny, okay? But metals are shiny, okay? So what did we say phosphorus was? You remember? Let me point phosphorus out for you. Phosphorus is right there. <coughs> What was gold? No. Gold is there. Okay, you're gonna be looking for a pattern. Carbon was non-metal. Carbon is here. Copper was metal. Copper is there. Bromine, non-metal. Aluminum, metal. Sulfur, non-metal. Nickel, metal. Lead a metal and tin is a metal. Do you see a pattern? Yeah. What is it? The metal metal metal. Metal. They're all metals. So see this stair step here. Somebody drew that on with a marker. But that actually is there. Most periodic tables will really make that bold. Okay? We call it a stair step. Things to the left of that stair step are metals. Things to the right of that stair step are non-metals. Things that are on the stair step, silicon, germanium, arsenic, antimony, tellurium, and polonium, are what we call metalloids. We're not really gonna work with metalloids. Metalloids are kind of stuck in the middle, okay? We're gonna be dealing with metals on the left, non-metals on the right. So that's one thing we can already tell from periodic <coughs> We can take an element, find where it is up here, and know whether it's a metal or a non-metal. What's on the left? Metals. Metals are on the left. What's on the right? Non-metal. Non <coughs> and what did I say are right on the stair step? Metal. 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 Okay. Our matter is made up of atoms. An atom is the smallest piece that you can break an element down into and have it still be that element. So if I have a chunk of iron, I have a big chunk of iron. That chunk of iron is made up of iron atoms. If I take that chunk of iron and I'm strong and I break it in half, I have two chunks of iron, right? It's still iron, it's not didn't become tin or anything like that. If I keep breaking it down, it's going to stay iron. Eventually I'm going to get down to an atom. And that atom, while it has part of smaller particles in it, but if you break that atom up, it is no longer iron. Okay? So the atom is the smallest building block. 
periodic table are the types of building blocks that we have to work with. Those are all the building, building blocks we have. Everything in the universe <coughs> has matter <coughs> is made up of some combination of those atoms. Elements have names and they have symbols. A lot of them are intuitive, so easy to remember. Okay? Every symbol is going to be one or two letters. We're not going to deal with it. Some of these down here have three, but that's because they haven't been given the actual names yet. That's like some sort of Greek. It's telling the number. Like 104 is on a little quadium. That's somehow that's Greek for, or Latin for 104. Okay? If an element has a name, it's going to have a symbol that's one or two letters. Carbon is C, calcium is CA. Those sort of make sense, right? Iron is FE. What's with that? <laughs> yeah. Ferris. Yeah, it's it's Ferris. Where does Ferris come from? I believe it's Latin. I think it's Latin or Greek. Let's leave it at that. Okay. I think it's Latin. It's not English. Okay. So for the person who gave iron the symbol Fe, they called iron ferrous. So to them, Fe made perfect sense. It's just people who made English decided to change the word for some reason. So these are some of the ones that don't make sense. Okay. Copper is Cu because it was originally called cuprum. Gold is Au because it was aurum. Lead is plumbum. Okay. These are why they don't seem to make sense. They originally did make sense. Okay. This is the periodic table you need to know for next week. Okay. If you if it's not blacked out, you need to come in next week, being able to go back and forth between the symbol and the name. If I give you a name, you need to give me the symbol. If I give you a symbol, you need to be able to give me the name. Okay. This is in the slides. The slides, if you haven't already printed them out, are online. Not only are they in the slides. In the modules, there's an entire PDF right here. Elements you're required to know. It is this periodic table below that. If blacked out, don't worry about it. Okay? What I did is I went through and I blacked out the ones that aren't common elements. So the only ones that are up here are the ones you're going to run into over and over and over and over again this semester. After next Tuesday, for the rest of the semester, you will have a periodic table to use. <coughs> so you don't have to memorize these past next week. But I said I wasn't going to waste your time. So why am I making you memorize them for next week? You're going to use these over and over and over again throughout the semester. And if you have to look them up every time you use them, you're going to spend your entire time looking up elements. So if you memorize them for a week, you may not memorize them after that, but a lot of them are going to be in the back of your head and you're going to know them. Okay? So it's going to save you a lot of time going forward. So next week when we take the quiz, you'll all turn your desk that way so you can't see that. After that, you'll be able to see that and you'll actually have a pure tool <coughs> with the quiz that you Atoms don't only exist as single atoms. They also can combine together in molecules. So these are both types of molecules. So we have a lot of drawings and pictures like this. You have to kind of interpret what the artist was trying to say. You need to look at the size and the color. 
if an atom is the same color and the same size, assume it's the same type of atom. Okay. So in this molecule, we have two atoms, two, two spheres, and they're the same color and size. So this molecule is made up of two atoms of the same element. We don't know what it is, but at this point it doesn't matter. In this molecule, we have three atoms. We have two of the red ones and one of the black ones. There are two different elements in that molecule. Any molecule is made up of at least two atoms. If there are two or more atoms bound together, no matter what type of element they are, that is a molecule. So we've got this side straightened out. Okay? We need to deal with compounds. Okay? A compound is a pure substance that's made up of more than one element. Okay? A compound is a pure substance that's made up of more than one element. If it was just one element, it'd be over here. If there's more than one element, come over here to compounds. This is iron pyrite. You don't know how to read these symbols yet, but this is saying the formula for iron pyrite has iron and it has sulfur. This is a compound. This is a mixture of iron and sulfur. <coughs> that has iron and sulfur. This has iron and sulfur, which are two very different things. This is a compound. This is just iron and sulfur put together. Okay. The compound has properties. The color, what it conducts electricity, things like that, what it dissolves in, the shape. It's different than the elements that make it. So here, the iron and the sulfur combine to make iron pyrite that doesn't look like iron, and it doesn't look like sulfur. But when you combine iron and sulfur, you have iron that looks like iron, and you have sulfur that looks like sulfur. So this is a compound that is not. Water is a compound. What two elements are in water? Hydrogen and oxygen. Hydrogen and oxygen. You can actually break down water into hydrogen and oxygen. All you have to do is put a bunch of electricity through it. It's called electrolysis. Okay? So here's water hooked up to electricity, and we're breaking it down into hydrogen and oxygen. Hydrogen and oxygen are gases. So we get bubbles. Okay? We haven't gone over this yet, so you're probably not going to know. But can anyone look at this picture and tell me which two is collecting hydrogen and which one is collecting oxygen? What's different between the two? <coughs> the left one is taking hydrogen. Say it again? The left one is taking hydrogen. Why? Why do you say that? Because all the gas is collected in there. Like You're on the right track. You just got to say the right words. What's different between that two and that two? The, well, the right one is having more, has more liquid. Right? The right one has more liquid, which means the left one has more what? Air. Gas. Gas. So this one has more gas than that one. Okay. One of them is collecting hydrogen. One of them is collecting oxygen. We'll learn how to read these formulas, but that two means there's twice as many hydrogen atoms as there is oxygen atoms. So you're going to get twice as much hydrogen gas as you're going to get oxygen gas. Okay. Sand is a compound. It's silicon dioxide. It's made up of silicon and two oxygens. That's what this formula is telling us. We call these subscripts. That subscript tells us how many of that element are in that compound. We don't write subscript ones. If there's no subscript, it's assumed it's a one. So this says there's one silicon, which is Si, 
and there's two oxygens, which is O. So we're just going to look at these. You're going to tell me whether it's an element or a compound. Is that an element or a compound? What well, one? Yeah, number one. Oh, element. Um, it's an element. How do you know? It's just one what? It's, like one. One. it's not a combination. And it's right there. Yeah. Right? Yeah, yeah. The, the, just the hard way, there's the thinking way, and then there's a the simple way, right? You can think about all the, the ideas that we just concepts that we just talked about, or you can say it's there. <laughs> okay? So it's it's that's there. So it's an element. Element or compound? Compound. compound. Why do you say that? Because it's two elements. It's two elements. That's the thinking way. What's the non-thinking way? It's not up there, right? If it's not up there, it's not an element. Sodium chloride. The compound. Compound. Why? Because it's sodium separate. Sodium and it's chloride. Okay. We'll we'll talk about in a couple weeks why it's chloride instead of chlorine. But mm. it is chlorine, okay? It's just in the name, it's I. <coughs> Don't worry about it. Copper. Uh, Copper is up there. It's an element. Element versus compound is simple. Is it up there? <coughs> if it is, it's an element. If it's not, it's a compound. Okay. Take a break now. We'll start at. 7.40 on that clock. That <coughs> clock is not correct. So it's 7.40 on that clock. Anybody want one of these tutoring cards? I'll just give one to everybody.
So when we started our little classification, we had matter at the very top, and we came down to compounds, no sorry, pure substances in mixture. So we finished the pure substances side. We have to do the mixture side. A mixture is a mixture, which is a word you're very familiar with, of two different things. And they can be two elements, two compounds, 
element and a compound, five elements and three compounds, but they're mixed together, but they're not bound together. They're not bound together like two elements in a molecule where they're stuck together. They're just tossed in the basket together. That's a mixture. Because if you have a mixture, you can separate them apart by what we call a physical process. Think of it as being able to just pick one type up and move it over here and the other one over there. If you can move them apart, that's a physical process. That's a mixture. So pencil lead is a mixture. There are a number of things that go into making that lead. I think there's clay, there's certainly graphite, but it's all just kind of mixed together, pressed into a lead shape, and cooked till it's hard. That's a mixture. Salt water is a mixture. Mixture of what? Well, the water has the hydrogen and the oxygen, and the salt contains three salts. Well, you said the, the water has hydrogen and oxygen. They're the two elements, but that's not a mixture. Because they're bound together. It's a, it's a compound, okay? <coughs> so water is a compound. Salt. What is salt? Salt. Just, right, just salt and there's water, and they're mixed together. Salt has a, a more chemistry-sounding name. NaCl. Sodium chloride, NaCl, okay? <laughs> so sodium chloride is a compound. It has sodium and chloride. So salt water is a mixture of two compounds, salt and water. What about air? Why is air a mixture? What's it a mixture of? Oxygen. It's oxygen, carbon. carbon dioxide. You can name a whole lot of gases, right? Some of them are elements. Oxygen is an element. Carbon dioxide is a compound. There's just a whole bunch of different gases floating around, <coughs> and they just mix with each other. So air is a mixture. Salt water is a mixture, we said. And we said mixtures can be separated by a physical process. The easiest way to get the salt out of the water is just let the water evaporate. Salt doesn't evaporate, water does. So you let it sit around, and eventually you have a big pile of salt. That's how they get a lot of the table salt, and the salt that they put on the roads up north, things like that. They literally take piece of the ocean, build a little wall, and let it dry up. And they got salt left. <coughs> and this evaporation is a physical process. We'll talk a lot more about evaporation later. So as you figured out, everything can be broken down into more categories. A mixture has two different possibilities. It can be a homogeneous mixture or it can be a heterogeneous mixture. This classification is the fuzziest of all of them. Okay? So just do your best to stay with me and not beat me over the head when we disagree. A homogeneous mixture is the same throughout. So let's go back to the Gatorade. Gatorade has water and sugar and all kinds of stuff in it. So it's a mixture. But we said it's the same at the top as it is at the bottom. Everything in there is Gatorade. It's all the same. That's a homogeneous mixture. The opposite is a heterogeneous mixture, where you have a mixture, but different pieces of it are different. That's like the orange juice with the pulp. It's all orange juice with pulp, but if you let it settle, there's orange juice and there's pulp. And even when you shake it up, the pulp is obviously separate from the juice, right? It's just floating around in the juice. So it's a mixture. You have orange juice, and you have juice and pulp, but they're distinct from each other. It's not like Gatorade, where you can say, well, I'm going to take the sugar and put it over here, and put the water over here. The pulp, you can easily get that pulp out of there. So we have homogeneous mixture and heterogeneous mixture. Did you say salt water? The homogeneous mixture or heterogeneous mixture? Hetero? Hetero. 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 It's homogeneous. Why? It's the same. If I have a, a, 
a glass of salt water, the salt water on the top is going to be the same as the salt water on the bottom. If I let that salt water sit there, assuming the water doesn't evaporate, the salt's not going to settle out. Right? If you're dealing with a mixture in, in a liquid, the key is whether it will settle out. If it would settle out, it's heterogeneous. If it won't settle out, like Gatorade, it's homogeneous. Okay? What about lake water? Heterogeneous. So we're making the assumption that lake water has dirt and fish and all kinds of stuff in it. So there's the water, and then there's all the stuff that's in it. If I go to a lake, and take a sample of it, set it on the bench, and come back, an hour later, there's probably going to be dirt sitting on the bottom of it. That will settle out. So tap water, or sorry, lake water is a heterogeneous <coughs> water. What about tap water? We're going to hope your tap water is homogeneous. <laughs> Hopefully it's not heterogeneous. If it is, you got a problem. What about the air? It's homogeneous. Okay? The air that's over here it's not different than the air that's in the back. Okay? It's homogeneous. Can anyone come up with a, well, if you look at it this way, explanation of why air could be heterogeneous? Say it again. Smoke. Smoke. What if there's somebody up here smoking? Right? Eventually, that smoke is going to fill the entire room. But for a while, there's the, the gases that come off when you burn it, the CO2 and things like that, that are here that eventually will get back there. But for a while, there's more of it here than over there. So that's why I say these, these, categories, these categories are kind of fuzzy. A lot of them are, well, it depends on how you look at it. So if you're doing homework, if you're doing quiz, and you say, well, this question depends how you look at it. Give me your answer and explain how you're looking at it. If how you're looking at it leads you to the answer you gave me, you're going to get it right, even if the answer you gave me is different than what I was looking for. Okay. What about brass? It says brass is an alloy of copper and zinc. You don't know what an alloy is. But thinking about brass, you've seen brass. Yes. Homogeneous or heterogeneous? Homogeneous. Homogeneous. But what if, how could brass be heterogeneous? Does anybody have brass in their house? What happens to brass? Rust? It, it, it's not technically rust, but it corrodes. It gets green crap on it, right? So if you have brass that's corroded, then it's heterogeneous. You have the green crap on the outside and the pure brass on the inside. But pure brass is a homogeneous mixture. What potting soil? Mm -hmm. Heterogeneous. There's probably going to be pieces of leaves and the little white perlite balls in there. And there's probably going to be some water in there. Say it again? Worms. worms. There's going to be worms. Potting soil is pretty heterogeneous. <coughs> Chocolate chip cookie dough is the one that everybody argues about. Heterogeneous or homogeneous? Hetero. Well, who can be devil play devil's advocate and tell me why it's homogeneous? After you bake it? Because it's the same. It doesn't settle. It doesn't do anything. It doesn't, it doesn't yeah. settle. It, it, if, you, if you take a sample of chocolate chip cookie dough, as, as long as it's mixed well, you're going to have probably the same number of chocolate chips in this piece as this piece over here. But the answer we're looking for is heterogeneous, because there is dough and there are chocolate chips. But this is one where you're probably doing a good thing by telling me how you're looking at it when you answer it. Okay. <coughs> this is our giant flowchart that we made. We have matter, it's gonna, it can be physically separated, the mixture, you come over here. If it can't, it's a pure substance, and you go down this. Okay? So this has some questions that you answer as you go. It can help you figure out where you're going and what it needs to be classified as.
we talk about matter and we show matter at several different levels in this class. This is a macroscopic representation, which is what we see. Macroscopic means real world, you can see it with your naked eye level. Okay? Then there's the molecular level. That is when we talk about salt water. We say that there are water molecules, and then there are salt molecules. So water and salt. <coughs> We're looking at the molecular level. There's also the symbolic representation. That's this. Okay? We can draw a chemical reaction with atoms, or we can write a chemical reaction using symbols. So that's another representation of matter. This is a molecular level representation. We are seeing atoms. We are seeing molecules. In this case, it's all copper, so it's atoms. When we talk about a molecular level representation, that's where we're drawing our little spheres and things like that. This is another molecular level representation. We're drawing atoms. Are these atoms or molecules? Atoms. Why are they both correct? They're both correct. Because they're the same. Is this what I'm circling? An atom or a molecule? It's a molecule. But what's it made out of? Two atoms. Two atoms. So in this picture, there are molecules, but there are also atoms, because the atoms are the individual spheres. The <coughs> molecules are the combination of the two spheres put together. Can I ask a question? Yeah. Are molecules always made up of atoms? Yes. And so they can be, in this case, it's two atoms of the same element. But carbon dioxide, CO2, is a molecule that's made up of one carbon atom and two oxygen atoms. Would you call this an element, a compound, or a mixture? A compound. It's an element. They're molecules. But a molecule can be an element or a compound. In this case, it's the same color, they're the same size, so they're the same element. So you have a molecule that's made up of two elements. It may sound weird to call that an element, but it's not a compound and it's not a mixture. So it's an element, okay? We'll talk about this later on, again, later in the semester. Some elements, if they're by themselves, will always exist as two atoms together. <coughs> Most of them will just be one atom on its own. But there are a few of them that will always be together like that. So, A. Element, compound, or mixture? Be a compound. Compound. It's a compound. So that is a compound, right? There's a black mm. atom and a red atom. But all four molecules are the same. So that is a compound. Each one is a compound. But as a whole, it's also a compound. What about B? It's an element. They're molecules, but all of the atoms are the same type. So this is an element. What about C? A mixture. It's a mixture. It's a mixture of what? It's a mixture of elements. We have blue elements, and we have black elements. What about D? It's a mixture. It's a mixture of what? Elements. It's an element and it's a compound, right? It's a mixture of an element and a compound. What about E? A compound, compound mixture? It's a mixture of compounds. Yeah. yeah. So as a whole, it is a mixture. But <coughs> these are all compounds. That's one type of compound, and that's another type of compound. So a mixture can be two elements, two compounds, or elements and compounds. We also already talked about physical states. You know solid, liquid, gas. Okay. Yes, there is plasma if you want to get into it, but we're not going to talk about plasma. That's well beyond this class. So we have solids, liquids, and gases. 
If you wanted to tell me the macroscopic properties <coughs> of solids, liquids, and gases, what would you tell me? The depends for which. What's a macroscopic property of a solid? It has a definite shape. Perfect. What else? This is a solid, right? What? What? Well, they're all going to have weight. Well, actually, you're, you're not wrong. A, a macroscopic property of this is weight. But it's also going to be a macroscopic property of <coughs> the liquids and the gases. You're right. You're right. What else? It has a definite mass, right? What else? But you look at this. You know it's a solid. It's concrete. It's concre co concrete. We can interact with it, right? What else? It doesn't change. It doesn't change. But there's something, you look at that, and you know it's a solid. You haven't touched that, but you know it's a solid. It doesn't move. It doesn't move. It does, a liquid would move, right? Yeah. A gas would move. It doesn't move. It's, what does that mean? But a solid can move if it has wheels. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you, you're, you're correct. It's not going to move on its own, though. Well, let's... <laughs> <laughs> Well, what is this telling you? Hollow. It's not hollow. It's hard, right? Solids are hard. Those are macroscopic properties of a solid. What's a macroscopic property of a liquid? Well, no, it's not so <coughs> Like a vapor, like a convection, like a gas. No, that's a gas. Gas. It doesn't have a definite shape. What? Doesn't have a definite shape. Liquid doesn't have a definite shape. We say it takes the shape of its container. Right? What about its volume? Does the liquid have a definite volume? Yes. Pretty much. I mean, <coughs> if, if, if I have a glass of water, right, and I pour it into something that's a different shape, it's going to change its shape, but it takes up the same amount of space. So that's a definite volume. Liquid has a definite volume, but no definite shape. What about a gas? Does it have a definite shape? No. no. No, certainly not. Does it have a definite volume? No. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. It, it does it not. It doesn't. It doesn't. Gas. Gases will expand to fill whatever they're in. Okay. So if I have a a big box, okay, and then in that box. I have a balloon. There's air <coughs> in that balloon. If I pop that balloon, the air that's in that balloon is then going to expand to fill the box. Okay. So that's a macroscopic level. But think about them at the molecular level. What do you think is different between solids, liquids, and gases at the molecular level? What makes these macroscopic differences? They also move at different speeds. Anybody remember which one moves the fastest? Solids, liquids, and gases. 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 Solids move the slowest. So solid atoms in a solid, atoms or molecules in a solid, are barely moving. Okay? They're more or less just kind of shaking in place. Gases are moving very fast. They're zooming all over the room. Okay? I don't remember the speed off the top of my head. It's in a later lecture, but it's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of miles per hour. Okay? They're just flying around. Liquids are in between. They're a lot closer to solids than gases, because a liquid is going to stay here. But they're moving around in that liquid. If I have a cup of water, at one, one moment, a specific water molecule may be at the top, but then later it may be at the bottom. If I have ice, an ice cube, the water molecule on top is going to stay at the top. It's not going to move. Okay? So they move at different speeds. What else is different between them? If I have, let's say we have liquid water. Okay? 
we're going to evaporate. We're going from a liquid to a gas. We said that the atoms are going to be moving faster, right? What did we say about the <coughs> volume of a liquid? Does it change or stay the same? It changes. Liquid stays the same. So, yes. What about a gas? It changes. It changes. So if I have <coughs> a beaker up here, a Bunsen burner, and I boil some water, the water is going to stay here, right? But when it turns into a gas, it's going to end up over there, and over there, and over there. So do you think the water molecules are closer together in the liquid or in the gas? In the liquid. They're closer in the liquid. So when you have a solid, the atoms are right next to each other. They're packed in as tight as they can possibly be, and they just kind of shake. When you go to a liquid, they move just a little bit further apart. Okay? Just a little bit further apart, more or less just enough to get a little elbow room that they can move around. But then when you go to a gas, they completely move away from each other. Okay? So gases move the fastest, and the molecules and atoms are the furthest apart. This is basically what we just talked about. Whether the shape, the volume, don't worry about the whole pressure thing. Gases can be compressed. We use this a lot, right? Can I compress this desk? No. Probably not very easily, right? But it's very easy to compress <coughs> a gas. You just use a pump and you can pump it into your car. What about a liquid? Yes. Theoretically, yes. Realistically, no. Think about it. In a solid, we said they're packed as close as they can be. In a liquid, they move a little bit further apart. But you can, even though you can push them back together like that, there is some space. Good luck trying to do it, right? Imagine if you ever taken a syringe and you cap the end with your finger and it's full of air. You can push that syringe down pretty easily, right? You can probably all imagine that. If the syringe is full of water, and you cap the end, are you going to be able to push that syringe? No. no. If you had enough force, like a big machine or something, you could probably get it to move a little bit, but then you're not going to go any further. But with that gas, you can probably compress that syringe down to almost nothing. This is a state change. Obviously, know that things go from solids to liquids and gases and back. So, there are two changes going on. What state of water are in that picture? Liquids and gases. So, what changes are happening between those things? You have evaporation, so we have the liquid water becoming gas. That's what happens when you evaporate water. And what else is happening? Condensation. Condensation is going from a gas to a liquid. So here we have water it's evaporating out, but then it condenses back on the outside. It goes from a gas to a liquid. When we write chemical formulas, we always have to give what state they are in. And so we use these little <coughs> letters in parentheses to mean solid, liquid, gas, or aqueous. Aqueous means dissolved in water. Okay? We're not going to come to that for a while. But solid, <coughs> liquid, and gases, self-explanatory, S, L, and G. Okay? Here's an example. This is sodium chloride solid. That means we have sodium chloride solid. That is what's in your shaker on your kitchen table. Okay? Solid sodium chloride. On the, mole on the macroscopic scale, how would you describe sodium chloride itself? 
macro, which is the real world. It's white, it's white and granular. Hard to go much past that. What, um, what about the molecular scale? What would that look like? What's in salt? That's what I mean. All right. It's a compound made of what? Two. Two elements. What are those elements? Sodium and chloride. Sodium and chloride. So you have a sodium atom next to a chlorine atom. Okay? So that's explaining what they look like. <coughs> How fast are they moving? Slow. 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 How far apart are they? Not much. Not very. They're very close together. So that's how you would explain or describe sodium chloride solid solid at the molecular level. Now we're going to start, because we're changing things, we have another classification to make. We have physical changes and chemical changes. And those changes are changes in properties. So we have physical change is a change in physical property. A chemical change <coughs> is a change in a chemical property. A physical property is something that we can figure out about an element or a compound or a substance or a mixture without changing it. What is a physical property of this poster? <coughs> Solid. Say it again. Solid. It's a solid. You know it's a solid. Right? But not a physical property about it. Uh, shape? Okay, it's it's shape. shape. Shape is a physical property. It's color. The color is a physical property. What it's made of. What it's made of is a physical property. And the texture of it. Yeah. We're gonna, we'll, we'll call that a chemical property. Okay. Texture. We'll the texture. Texture is a physical property. Is mass physical? Or? Mass is physical. We just put it on a scale, right? We're not changing what it is. That's a physical property. Pretty much anything that our senses are going to tell us about this is a physical property. Okay? I can pick, I don't have to put it on a scale. I can't tell you how many pounds it is, but I can tell you it's, a lot, it's heavier than this. <coughs> Color is a physical property. Smell is another physical property. Color and smell are what we call qualitative properties. That means that we can tell, we can describe it, but we can't put a number on it. Okay, you can't say what color this desk is. If you know HTML and hex codes, and you're a programmer, forgive me, but you can't put a number on this desk. Okay. You also can't put a number on the smell of a burrito. You can't say it smells 15. <laughs> Perfume companies may want to put numbers on it, but they're just randomly throwing numbers. Okay, Chanel number five very well could have been Chanel number seventeen. <laughs> <laughs> right? The other physical properties are mass, volume, density, and temperature. We can put numbers to those. I can tell you how many pounds this weighs. I can tell you how many liters of Coke are in a bottle. I can tell you the density. <coughs> of water, or what the temperature is in this room, in numbers. These are quantitative properties, like quantity, numbers, quantitative properties. So a physical change is a change in a physical property. So we're changing the physical property of a substance, but we're not changing the chemical composition. It is still what it started as. If I evaporate water, <coughs> it went from liquid to gas. It changed physical property, <coughs> but it is still H2O. I did not, there was no chemical reaction, there was nothing, it's still H2O, okay? Changes in physical state are physical changes. This is a idea that's going to come up on a lot of homework and quizzes, okay? And it's, it's confusing. Because if you look at liquid water in water vapor, or an ice cube in liquid water, they look like very different things. But at the molecular level, they are H2O. So 
So when you're trying to decide if something is a physical or chemical change, you have to think about the molecular level. If the molecule did not change, is a physical change. So this is evaporation. Another way to say it is vaporization. Evaporation is the word that you know. So this is liquid water becoming water gas, okay? Water vapor. It's still <coughs> H2O. It's still H2O, but they just spread apart. This is sublimation. Sublimation is going from a solid straight to a gas without becoming a liquid in between. Dry ice does this. If you take dry ice and just set it out, it goes from a solid to a gas. It'll disappear, but you're never going to see liquid CO2 coming off of it. Okay? So this is solid CO2. If I was going to draw a molecular representation of CO2 gas, how would I draw that? Clear. Right. So we're going to take these CO2 molecules, it's hard, probably hard to see, but there are red ones and black ones there. <coughs> I'm just going to take a few of them, and spread them apart, and add some little ski lines coming off of them. Right? So that you know they're flying around. So we took these, drew them out, and because it's a computer, we can draw these cool little reflections. But you look at that and you know they're moving. You don't know why that means they're moving because if you could actually see them, there wouldn't be a little trail coming up behind them. But we know that means they're moving. So these are state changes. You need to know these. Luckily, you already know 90% of them. Okay? So a solid to a liquid is melting. Liquid <coughs> to a solid is freezing. You know, them. you don't have to go home to memorize those. Liquid to a gas is vaporization or evaporation. Either word, but you already know evaporation. Gas to a liquid is condensation. You know that word, it's probably not one you use as often as melting and freezing, but if you think about it, you know the word condensation. Okay? Condensation is the water that shows up on the outside of your glass. That's a noun, but condensation is also the process of going from the gas to the liquid. The two that you're going to have to remember are sublimation and deposition. Sublimation goes from a solid to a gas. I don't have any good way of memorizing that. I don't know where the term sublimate. I can't see a root word in there. Okay. Going from a gas to a solid is deposition. This one, I remember because it has the word deposit on it, in it. So if you have a gas, you can't really see that. It's a gas. It's floating around. And then all of a sudden, a solid starts appearing on a surface. Okay? It looks like it's being deposited on that surface. We'll do this in lab in a few weeks. Okay? We'll take an iodine crystal, which is a solid. We'll heat it. It'll go straight from a solid to a gas. So you'll get a purple gas coming off this crystal. And then it'll float up, and then we'll have an ice tray at the top. So when it touches the ice tray, it deposits. So you'll get these neat little purple crystals showing up on the bottom of this tray. Make sure you know these. I guarantee you it'll be in homework quizzes and final exam. A chemical change is a change where we change the actual composition of what we're dealing with. When we took the H2O and separated it into H2 and O2, that was a chemical change. It is not H2O anymore. It's H2 and it's O2. This is a chemical reaction. Okay. From here on out, we're going to talk about chemical reactions. A chemical reaction is, is a type of a chemical change. So think about it. At the molecular level, did the molecules change? If the molecules change, it is a chemical change. 
pennies. What does a new penny look like? It's shiny. What does an old penny look like? It's tarnished. It's got that dull coating on the outside, right? That's a chemical react. It's actually a chemical reaction. It's reacting with the oxygen in the air. It just takes a very long time to happen. Eventually, what you get is copper oxide on the outside. It's the compound of copper and oxygen. It's a chemical reaction. It is no longer just copper. It is copper and oxygen combined. Burning, not just burning gasoline, but burning anything, is a chemical change. It is a chemical reaction. You're, again, reacting with oxygen. It's just the difference is how fast it happens. When you burn gasoline, it reacts with oxygen very, very fast. A penny reacts very, very slowly. Not only is separating water into hydrogen and oxygen a chemical change, but if you take hydrogen and mix it with oxygen, it will react. Hydrogen burns, and you'll get water. Okay. Does anyone know what the Hindenburg <coughs> is or was? The Hindenburg? You ever heard the phrase, oh, the humanity? Nope. You've seen the video of the, 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 uh, the blimp burning? Oh, yeah. That was the Hindenburg. They used to put hydrogen in blimps, OK? Hydrogen is very, 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 very flammable. If you hit a power line with a flammable balloon, what do you think is going to happen? Blow up. It's going to blow up. Okay. So when that blimp blew up and burned, it was actually making water. The hydrogen in that blimp was reacting very, very fast and very violently with the oxygen in the air to make water. This is sort of a molecular level drawing of a chemical reaction. Here we have hydrogen molecules and we have oxygen molecules. After the reaction, we have water molecules. The hydrogen and the oxygen <coughs> are now combined together. When we write out a chemical reaction, we use these arrows. The way you read that is it yields, meaning it makes this or it gives this. So this yields that. We have a picture, and below it is it written out with our symbols. So this is saying hydrogen plus oxygen yields water. Okay. There are some things that we can look at if it give us a hint <coughs> that a chemical reaction is happening. Because we can't see molecules. We can't see that they're changing. So how can we look at something that's changing and tell when the molecules are changing? So there's, these are our clues. If there's bubbling, a permanent color change, or a sudden change in temperature, those are clues that we have a chemical change happening. What is the big exception to bubbling? <coughs> um, ev evaporation. Boiling. You said boiling is going from liquid water to water vapor, right? <coughs> it's still H2O. It's a physical change. But there's bubbling. But the bubbling is because we're heating it, because we're making it evaporate. If you see bubbling, you have to figure out, is it bubbling because we're making bubbles in a reaction, or is it bubbling because we're heating it and evaporating it? That's something you have to figure out. Permanent color change and sudden change in temperature, like burning something, has a sudden change in temperature. So, we just said boiling is a what? Physical. Physical change. But we have our bubbles. Is this a chemical change or a physical change? Is it before and after? It's a, chemical change. it's a chemical change, right? Here we have this, which it tells us is CH4. CH4 is methane. And then we have this, which it tells us is oxygen. <coughs> Over here, we have water, 
which was not over there, and we have this, which is CO2, which was not over there. So things have clearly changed. It's a chemical change. What about this? Chemical or physical? Physical. Physical. These are CO2 molecules that we had before, and these are just stacked in there. Another one of our little text in. Okay. So here's a picture. You may know what that's a picture of. If you don't, try to figure out what it is. But don't ask anybody. Okay? And then before you text in, I need to go to the website and activate it. Okay. So if you think that's a chemical change, text that number to that number. If you think it's a physical change, text that number to that number. because you have no idea what it is you're actually looking at. So we have eight chemicals, seven physicals. Okay. So I am going to clear that. I'm going to go back and I'm going to tell you what happened. This is a coffee filter. You can't tell by the caption. The coffee filter, they took a black <coughs> Sharpie and they put a dot in the middle of it. Okay? And they folded it up into a cone so that the black dot was at the point. Can you all picture that? And then they dipped it down into a cup of water so just the tip of the coffee filter was in the water. So we have, so you get to see how badly I draw. Better get used to it, you guys see a lot of it. So we have a cup of water, and then we have a coffee filter like that, and then the bottom tip is colored black. After a while, a coffee filter looks like that. Do you think now there's a chemical <coughs> change or a physical change? Chemical. Text it. groups that just aren't obvious groups the way you said. Let's do U6 and U, um, U4, U4, uh, 4 and 4. Let's do that. So rows, I guess, I guess these are columns. So U4, 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 and then U6. Get together. What you're going to do, you're going to try to convince your group members that you are right. Okay? Your job is to convince the other people, but most likely what's going to happen is these 11 people are going to try to convince these three people that it's a chemical change. And these three physical change people are going to try to convince the chemical change people that it's actually a physical change. After a few minutes, <coughs> we're going to get back, go break up, and then you're going to text what you think. If you think everyone in your group is wrong, you're going to text what you think. Okay? 
The purpose of the group is just to try to convince the other people what to say. Go ahead. changes than physical changes. Let me clear it again. <laughs> we'll come back and I'll just give you a little more information. Okay? So we, when we get this into the water, what's going to happen to this coffee filter in the water? I'm not 
absorb it's gonna absorb water. So the water is going to slowly absorb and go up the whole coffee filter until the whole coffee filter is wet. Okay? And Emily, what did you say about black? That black is every color. Black is every color. So this marker is black. What makes it black? Every color. They put every color ink in here. Okay? So that's what makes a black marker black. So now that you know that black marker is made up of a bunch of colors, and you know that this water is going to go up through that coffee filter. Text your answer again. Uh, <laughs> is the whole coffee filter being dip or just a tip? Just a tip. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> you know what? Okay, so these are okay. Yeah, it's a tip. Yeah, it's just changing the color. Yeah, and then eventually, like, it starts red and then just goes to every color. Over time. It's kind of like, if you were to see it like that. But it's cool, Alex. Yeah, right? That's pretty cool. Whoa. <laughs> Now you're on the right track. So tell me, why is that a physical change? Because nothing really changed in the. So what happened? It just soaked it up. It just soaked it up and it just expanded the water. Colors. But why is. It's not like it took the black and it just moved it out. Now all of a sudden we have colors. Oh, they all came together. Right. They came together when? When they were black. When they were black, they yeah. were together. Yeah. And the, water made the water made them separate. Yeah. Yeah. So now we can see the individual colors. Why do you think they separated? Why, why would they do that? Does that mean the shape? You, you're, you're, you're right. What about diffusion? Well, I know it goes to what's higher and lower, right? So it made <laughs> Diffusion is not the perfect word, but you're on your. I think you know what, what's going on. Yeah. Disperse. What made it disperse? But why didn't it disperse the red the same as it dispersed the blue? Because the concentration properties of each one. Of them. <laughs> so what would happen? What would happen if I took this coffee filter? Okay. And I put, let's say, I put some sugar in the bottom of it, okay? And I put some sand in the bottom of it. And I put it in the, in the water again. What's going to happen to the sand? It's, it's, gonna the it's just going to sit there. Yeah. What's going to happen to the sugar? It's, it's going to dissolve, and it's going to go up. So what's different between the sugar and the salt that makes them behave differently? whether they dissolve. So here, the different colors dissolve to different degrees. Oh. The red didn't dissolve. The blue dissolved really well. The yellow dissolved kind of halfway in between. Okay? What were the three clues that we said were chemical changes? Bubbling. Bubbling. Permanent color change. Temperature change. Temperature change. Sudden temperature change. Do you think there was bubble in here? No. Do you think there was a sudden temperature change here? No. Wasn't that a permanent color change, though? Is it permanent? I'm asking you. But how, uh, how on earth are you going to put that back together? You could bleach it. Bleaching would be a chemical change. So do you think if you just dip the whole thing in the water, it would just come back together? Well, no, I think it just dissolves more. So there's, there's the, if you can have a perfect world, the way to do it would be to somehow make the water go the other way. Right. But how the heck are you going to, if you think really think about it, turning this upside down is not going to <coughs> solve that problem, because the blue is then going to go more, it's going to go all the direction. Okay? How? Could you get all those colors back together? 
let's assume that they are all that they all can be dissolved in water. It just takes different amounts of time for them to dissolve. What would happen if you put this coffee, this whole coffee filter, it will go black all the way in a, in a big thing of water, and let it sit there for a day, and all of it dissolved into the water? Yeah, I think it'll go back black for to, for a certain time, but it would. So all you then have all these colors in the water. The water is probably going to look kind of black. Yeah. And if you let that water evaporate, mm -hmm. then all that's going to be left at the bottom of the glass black. are all of these colors mixed together in black. So you have recombined these. That is a non-permanent color change. Okay. So now, now you can go back to your. He's got a few more. scientific method since first grade. Okay? What's the scientific method? What you did to get your hypothesis, conclusions, experiments, blah 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 blah. Right? Oh I guess I'm I'm jumping ahead. Okay. We'll, come, we'll get back to, to scientific method. I forgot about these two slides. Evaporation of water, chemical or physical change. Burning of natural gas. Chemical. chemical. Melting the metal. Physical. Physical. State change. Converting H2 and O2 to H2O. Chemical. chemical. Right? So we said a chemical change is a change in chemical property. Chemical property is a lot harder to wrap, wrap your head around than a physical property. Okay? A chemical property is the ability of a substance to undergo a chemical change. I'm trying to make that a simpler term, how reactive something is. If something is very reactive, it's going to be that the fact that it's very reactive is a chemical property. The fact that something is not very reactive is a chemical property. Hydrogen burns very, very, very easily. That's why the blimp blew up. That's a chemical property. Helium, which is what we now use in balloons and blimps, is completely unreactive. It's a chemical property. Iron rusts, chemical property. Silver tarnishes, that's another chemical property. Although gold, is very unreactive. Okay, now we're on scientific method. It's a way that we get answers. And you use a scientific method all the time, and you probably don't think of it as scientific method. <coughs> you have you go to the store, you're in public, you want to buy a watermelon. You gotta figure out whether the watermelon's right, because you're buying the whole thing, you're not buying the cup. How do you figure out whether it's right? Oh. Knock on it. You're doing an experiment, right? The question is, is it right? You knock on it. I honestly, is it hollow is right or hollow not right? Oh. Hollow is right, apparently. So you knock on it, you observe what you hear, and then you get an answer based on your your what you hear, your observations. But that's really, you get, you're still guessing whether it's right or not. You don't know it's right, okay? So scientific method includes observations, hypothesis, hypotheses, laws, and theories. The observation with the watermelon is you're knocking on it and you hear something. You may have a hypothesis looking at the watermelon. Is it green? If it's bright green, it may not be Right. Maybe I'll come with a hypothesis. Laws and theories are the tricky ones that people struggle with. Okay. Observations are just what you observe. 
if you're seeing something, if you're measuring something, if you're doing an experiment, that's an observation. A hypothesis is a testable explanation. Or another way to say it is an educated guess. It's what you think the answer is, and it's what you're going to test. You think that watermelon is right, but you're going to test to see if whether your observations back up your hypothesis. Hypothesis does not have to be correct. In science, when we make a hypothesis, I would say we're wrong 95% of the time. But that is not a bad thing. It's just that science is so hard to understand and to guess that when you do guess, you're probably going to be wrong. But once you do your experiments, you know the actual answer. And having the actual answer is what's important, not whether you guessed right or wrong to begin with. So your hypothesis is a testable explanation. A law describes how nature operates under a certain set of conditions. Always. Okay? So, if I take this marker and I drop it, what is going to happen? It's going to fall. It's going to fall. There is no doubt about it. Okay? That is a law. That is the law <coughs> of gravity. Things fall. Things that have mass are attracted to each other. That is a law. There is no explanation there, right? I just said, if I drop this, it falls. I'm not trying to explain why. But why is a theory. The theory <coughs> is the fact that two things that have mass are attracted to each other. That is the theory. That We believe it to be correct, but maybe tomorrow someone will prove that incorrect. But no one is ever going to prove that when I drop this marker, it does not fall. Okay? The law is the way things are. The theory is why that law exists. What makes that happen? So in the scientific method, generally we have some sort of an observation. We see, we see a watermelon. Okay? We just see, I see it and I say, that's a watermelon. That's an observation. It could have been an orange, right? And so I look for patterns or trends. I know that it's big and it's green, it's got some stripes on it. It's a watermelon. Okay? That's a pattern. Then I propose a hypothesis. I say, I think that watermelon is right. And then, I, there are two ways to go here. I don't know whether it's right yet, so I'm going to follow this arrow. So I'm going to get more data. I'm going to knock on it. When I do that, <coughs> I'm going to look for patterns. I know that the hollow means it's right. And so if I hear a hollow sound, I'm going to propose another hypothesis that it is right. Okay. And once you have enough data, once you've done this enough times, you can propose a theory. And in this case, that theory would be right watermelon sound hollow because the, the structure, the, the cells in there are breaking down and there's more empty space in there than there is in a non-right watermelon. But that, it's certainly an explanation. I'm probably wrong. I honestly don't know why a watermelon sounds hot. Okay? But now I have a theory. I've taken this one step further, but I have to prove that theory or disprove it. One of the two. 